You guys ever had a bad day? Um, just a bad day. One of the secrets I remember learning in parenting, I learned it a little too late, um, was um, sometimes your kids have bad days and it's just okay to let them have a bad day. Sometimes we don't expect our kids to ever have bad days, right? They have to behave and be nice and be respectful, but you and I, we don't have to, right? We get bad days. Yesterday, um, I had a bad day. It just, I woke up in the morning grouchy and there was no real reason for it. I was just grouchy. And anybody having a bad day today? Would you raise your hand? You want to testify anybody? You can, it's, uh, yeah, we have a couple back here. Sometimes you don't feel well. Sometimes you just, yeah, whatever. Yesterday I just woke up and I realized I was being grouchy to my wife. And I said, finally, Joy, I just admitted it. I said, I'm having a bad day. And I said, I'm not going to ruin your day as long as you stay out of my way for a little while. But if you get too close, um, I may ruin your day because I may say things I, I regret. Jesus had bad days too, although he never had to worry about saying something he would regret. But sometimes he said things that um, other people came to regret. And this is one of those times. Matthew chapter 13. Jesus was having a difficult day. In Matthew chapter 13, which actually forms a transition in scripture in the New Testament, where Jesus began to teach in parables where he had never taught in parables before, um, it had followed a really bad day. As a matter of fact, let's pick up in Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Now we're gonna spend the next several weeks on this parable, but I wanna talk to you about Jesus' bad day first. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus had healed a couple of people, which wasn't bad. That was really good. It may have been a day full of healing, but he got into an argument with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. And um, ultimately, the religious leaders of Jesus' day ended up calling Jesus Satan or saying that he worked for Satan. That was a pretty hard day. So Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and basically, and I encourage you to read this for yourself, told them, I think you've come to the point where there's no way you're ever going to believe in me and transitioned his teaching style and his audience of focus after this conversation. Later in that day, his mother and brothers came and visited him. And um, he told them, he said, you're my family. Again, this is Rick's paraphrase, but people who really are my family are the ones who are going to follow me, who are going to be disciples with uncommon faith and pointed at his disciples. And then he walked outside and got in a boat, probably pushed back another you know, 20, 30 feet, maybe 30 yards, who knows, not too far from shore. Disciples would have held the boat most likely to keep it from the current carrying it away. And Jesus began to teach and he began to teach in parables. And this particular parable, the parable of the soil is the first one, talked about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is mentioned eight times times in Matthew chapter 13. Now, you guys have already beat the odds. You defied the odds by um, being here today because it is, it is bad. I mean, I don't like talking about the weather, right? I mean, because we have people joining us online from places like Florida. Hi, if you're in Florida. Um, and here we are in April and it snowed. So if you're joining us online, it snowed this morning. And so you're already here. It was cold. It was windy. It was snowy. Uh, it's a little sleepy. You guys look a little sleepy. You look a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to I want you to wake up just, just a little bit. Well, just do a stretch with me, will you? We just do a stretch. Just raise the hands up in the air. Stretch, take the oxygen in. And um, if you're sure, I preached already once. I can't raise my arms because the sweat rings are under the arm. Wouldn't want to share. Wouldn't want to overshare with you guys. So I just thought I'd tell you. Um, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was really important, is really important. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, I believe, are interchangeable terms. It is where God is totally in control, where Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee shall bow. When God decided to create the earth, he did an experiment. It was the human experiment where he intended for Adam and Eve to mediate Jesus' rule here on earth and that every knee would bow and they would worship God. Adam and Eve sinned and the power was reversed for a period of time. And we entered into a period in the kingdom of God that some theologians call the interim period, the intermediate period. Don't get bored because this isn't boring. I'm just making it sound that way. Where Adam and Eve no longer could mediate the kingdom of God because they'd sinned and Satan became the, the father of this world temporarily. But Jesus still had a plan 
that God had a redemptive purpose and he began to try to bridge that gap, to bring back his reign for the kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it was in heaven. So we see in Genesis, I believe it was chapter eight, the Tower of Babel. And tradition tells us that Nimrod, the king, had just had a, a it was a fake experience, but an experience nonetheless, where he had a, a son who was killed uh, by wild beasts and uh, was supernaturally raised to life. And a bunch of people started believing in this. It became a cult called the mother-child cult. And, and all kinds of people got excited and started worshiping in false worship. And so the Tower of Babel was a construction for people to try to reach up to God and be like God. The Tower of Babel was destroyed. And um, tradition tells us, history tells us that all of the nations or the peoples who scattered took with them false belief paganism, but God wanted one pure chosen people. So God tapped Abraham on the shoulder and made an agreement with Abraham, a covenant. And this covenant was called, well, it was a covenant that was unconditional. A covenant that said, you're gonna follow me and out of you, one person is going to come a lot of people, a lot of land, and you'll influence the entire world. So God mediated his reign, the kingdom, Jesus principles through Abraham for a while. And the patriarchs of the faith sort of carried that down. Moses got a new covenant or agreement that was conditional. And this particular agreement said, if you obey my commandments and you follow me and listen to my words, I'll bless you. And then they had to do that. And the way they were challenged to do that was by appointing God's king. And so we see some great kings in the Old Testament who did their best for God's principles to be brought out to earth, us, played out. And we see some bad ones. Solomon collected wives and collected money. And so Solomon kind of broke the covenant or the vow between God and the children of Israel. Fast forward all the way to Jesus. Jesus came personally to try to mediate his rule here on earth, to try to unite with the Jewish people who God had set apart. And the Jewish people chose to reject him. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, we see the rejection and we see Jesus' response. And Jesus totally shifted his philosophy. And instead of preaching to the Jews, like he had done previously, he began to preach to the Gentiles and he began to preach to people who were interested and wanted to hear. And he essentially said, Many of you who have seen me for a while and know what I'm all about, don't care. And because you don't care, I think you've passed the point where you're ever gonna care. So I'm gonna talk to the people who do. And so Jesus began to speak in parables. A parable is a story that's absolutely made up by Jesus, but was literally told by Jesus, laid alongside a point, a spiritual point, to drive home a principle that we need to apply. So fast forward, Jesus came, the Jews failed to bend the knee to Jesus. So Jesus passed on the kingdom authority to the apostles for a period of time, who in turn passed it on to us, the church. And we are responsible as Christians to demonstrate what Jesus rule and every knee bowing to him, what it looks like for heaven to come down to look like here on earth and Jesus prepared us for it. And he prepared us for it partially through the parables. And so Jesus talks a lot about his kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom of God is a person who has confessed, who has decided to confess sin, to believe who Jesus is and to follow Jesus as their savior and their Lord a person who has become a citizen of the kingdom. And it's an internal commitment. It's something someone does when they decide I'm done with myself. I want to follow Jesus. I want to live this life of uncommon faith. And a person becomes a member of the, of the kingdom of God, a citizen of the kingdom. But the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us that some people say they're citizens of the kingdom. Some will even be in church. They'll die and go before the Lord, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. He talks about wheat and tares and sheep and goats. But a person who's a genuine citizen of the kingdom, connected all the way back to Abraham, 
has made an internal commitment to follow Christ. There's an external step that's supposed to be taken, and that is baptism, to identify, to put on the armor, to put on the uniform, to, to march under the banner of the kingdom of God. And many and some, maybe even perhaps here, were baptized as children or christened or we dedicate kids. That's certainly not an invalid experience, but how in the world can you enlist in the kingdom of God as a child? You can no longer, no more do that than you could enlist in the U.S. Army as a child. Your parents could say, this is what I intend for you, but until you're old enough to sign up for yourself, you can't do it. So it's a visible step of identifying with the body of Christ, saying I'm a member of the kingdom of God. Now that I can make a choice, that God has drawn me and this is who I am. And then we see after we've become citizens of the kingdom of God, him beginning to do a work in us that we call sanctification. As he begins to take us from the people we used to be and turn us into the people he wants us to be to look more like Jesus. And that's what God's doing in your life right now. So that when the world sees us, the way that I relate to my wife, to my kids, to my friends, to our staff, to our church, the way you relate in your marriage or your relationship with your children or your siblings, with the people closest to you and working its way out, to the things I say, is the way I forgive, just the compassion in my heart, just the grace I extend, does it look like heaven. Because when the disciples asked Jesus how they're supposed to pray, Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's next? Thy kingdom come. Oh, oh, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it already is being done in heaven. What we're literally praying is, God, make me a part of living out your kingdom here. And it doesn't begin with you. And it doesn't even begin with us. It begins with me. And so Jesus began in Matthew chapter 13 to speak in parables, both to reveal the truth to those who wanna hear the truth and to conceal the truth from those whose hearts were hard. And the principles about the kingdom of God that Jesus unfolds through the parables contain the secrets for us living this kind of life. And you and I each week for the next five or six weeks until we're done, we'll take our time and wring the truth out of some very key parables and apply them to our lives, not just so that we can change, but so that we can be a part of change. And by God's grace, he looks at my life and your life and the way that you conduct yourself, our church and the way we conduct ourselves. And by God's grace, the world who doesn't know Jesus can look and say, I don't have that. I want it. How do I get it? And then our words, we can explain, this is how you have peace with God. The kingdom parables, these stories are so important that we're gonna take time for the next five or six weeks to wring them out, to try them on and to live differently. And I wanna remind you that if you think that you are making Jesus a part of your life, you may not understand what Jesus had in mind because Jesus tells us that he is the life, the way, the truth, and the life. That we don't make Jesus part of our life. He is our life. We're gonna sing a few songs and come back and talk about how to apply just this principle and set the stage for us as we move into this series that I know you're gonna enjoy and I trust that God's gonna use as we live differently. Father, thank you so much for, my well, the first,
part of what we talked about was a, a little technical. We talked about the kingdom of God and we talked about the kingdom of God um, coming to earth and how Jesus desires this relationship with us where he's fully in charge and that Adam and Eve messed it up and that it was passed to Abraham and then it was passed through Moses and then priests, prophets, kings, and judges, ultimately Jesus, then the apostles, and then left with us. So we find ourselves on this continuum, this X in this timeline of life. And the question is, what do we do about it? Because the baton has been passed. And I want to talk about that as we conclude. And really the next few weeks, we're going to be opening up every week a parable and applying some of this truth. But I want us to just pray for a second because my sense and, and Pastor Dan's sense, um, I think Brandon and Jared had also sort of sense this, is that today many of you guys seemed a little burdened. You seem a little heavy. And um, I think that um, sometimes happens in the world that we live in. And I think there's a lot that competes for for our heart, for our minds, for our energy. And, um, and I know there's a spiritual war that goes on um, all the time. And I know that there are things that are within us that work against us and things outside us that work against us. And, um, and I sense this morning that some of you are just bearing a burden. Now, the beautiful part of bearing a burden is that the Bible tells us that if we cast our cares on Jesus, that he will do the caring for us, that you literally can give whatever it is, the burden of your heart that's weighing you down, that you can trust Jesus with it and allow him to bear it for you and to work out all of the billions of contingencies that um, are out of our control. And so I don't know if that hits you right uh, where you're living this morning or not. If it doesn't, then I promise you there are people around you who perhaps are bearing burdens, sometimes bearing burdens for yourself and sometimes for people closest to you. And I think sometimes bearing a burden for someone else is even harder than bearing a burden um, that's mine. And so let's just have a time real quickly of prayer where I can pray uh, for you. And Pastor Dan, do you have a microphone there? Will you come up and just pray with me for our congregation, for our friends? And whatever it is that um, you may be dealing with, uh, give it to the Lord. And if you're not, pray for the people who are around you because they may be bearing something very heavy this morning that we have no idea and can't see. You want to start? Uh, Lord, you know, if any of us know real life, as we talk about Easter last week, it was a culmination of your life and you experienced everything that we experienced but you did it perfectly. So you understand with your disciples that um, <laughs> some of us, uh, we struggle, Lord. It's, we struggle over the simple things, the things that we're supposed to lay at your feet, the fears, the anxieties, the what ifs. Lord, I'm encouraged that time and time again, the disciples went back to you and you had to readdress things. So Lord, just getting it right the first time, it's not, it's not part of your plan. You understand that we are human, that we are feeble. You alone lived the perfect life so you could take on what was ours to take. So Lord, today for my friends, I'm just uh, praying on their behalf praying with them that whatever is laying heavy on their mind, on their heart, that they would just right now, just lift that up to you. Knowing we don't just uh, toss up a prayer. You remind us that um, a broken and a contrite heart, the father never ever despise us, just like a mom or dad when we're listening to our kids. So Lord, we just lift these burdens up to you. If it's a relationship, finances, parenting, maybe the struggles we see in our community, in our country, the lies the enemy do a good job at overwhelming us. The truth, you remind us, Lord, sets us free because the truth is that you are in control. Daniel reminds us that you are the God, as he described you to others, that you are the God who gives us breath of life. Every breath is a gift. And yet, 
you also control our destiny. And Lord, that is who you are. You are good and we can trust you. Father, I agree with Dan's prayers and pray for my friends who are here who may be burdened and their hearts are heavy. And I pray she would lift those burdens, that she would give peace to those who are restless, hope to the hopeless, direction to the lost, that you would fill us with the understanding and knowledge of your love. I pray these things for my friends in your name. Amen. Thanks, Dan. So walking with God and living these kingdom principles is really hard. And um, as I mentioned a minute ago, there are things that get in the way, things within us, things outside us. We get in our own way. Other people get in our way. Satan tries to get in our way. And the staff and I, the pastors and I pray all the time that God will do great things through his church. And it occurred to us a couple of weeks ago, just in a very real way, that every single Sunday morning, God is doing great things because you guys are the great things that God is doing. You're beginning more and more um, every week, us together, grasping the things that we know and living these things out as best we can for God's honor, Jesus' honor, and his alone, not for our glory, but for his. And we're seeing our lives change. And when I see your life change, when we begin to line up more consistently with the kingdom of God and to live the way we were called as it was passed from Abraham to Moses through prophets, priests, kings, and judges to Jesus, the apostles, ultimately to us. If we don't live this way, not only will we find ourselves unfulfilled and lost, but no one will see Jesus. So I have a question for you. It's a hypothetical question, I guess. And I don't believe this to be true, but if this were true, if there was no heaven and if there was no hell, now I believe there's a heaven and I believe there's a hell, if, if there was no heaven and if there was no hell, no promise of reward, no fear of punishment, would you still choose to live your life for Christ? Would you still choose to live the way you do, to live according to the principles of the kingdom of God, even if there was no fear of punishment and no promise of reward? Because until our answer is yes, I don't think we fully grasp what the kingdom of God is all about. Now there is a promise of heaven and there is the reality of hell. But Jesus was bringing life and teaching us to live in a way that was life-changing and contagious so that people could see him and we could be part of him drawing all people to himself. And he changed his teaching style in Matthew 13. The Old Testament was full of parables. The New Testament, not yet. Stories, analogies, word pictures, not a parable. Matthew 13, the first time Jesus changed his teaching style to begin to teach people like you and like me who don't know everything, but have hearts that want to hear, ears that want to hear, eyes that want to see, spirits that want to listen. The disciples came to Jesus and said, why do you speak to people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Here's what it means. Some people don't wanna hear anymore and they could care less. Their hearts have grown cold and it appears there's no hope. But you, your hearts are open. You want to see, not only do you have hope, but commitment. And so I want to remind you, here's where you fit, because we're going to be applying these things every week for the next five or six weeks. Who knows, maybe more if we get some good momentum. I want to remind you of this Lord's Prayer 
Because when the disciples saw Jesus pray, in contrast to all of the other people that they saw pray, who just babbled on and on and on, trying to open up the kingdom of God with magic words and repetition, asking for things that ultimately glorified themselves and weren't really prayers at all. Jesus said, come here, come here, come here. This is how you pray. He said, our father in heaven, we love you and respect you and believe you. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Reunite all of humanity under the lordship of Jesus, where there is no sin, no sorrow, no sadness, and no suffering and no death. Your kingdom come and your will be done in my life, in our lives, in our lives on earth, just as it is in heaven. So when we pray that, what we're praying is Jesus allow me to be part of heaven coming down in the way I live. Not beginning with my church or our church or somebody else's church or your pastor or your missionary or your politician or your president or whatever it is. Beginning with me. And you take your finger and you point it right back here at you. And we say, how can I be part of living these principles of the kingdom of God in my life, in our church, in our community, in a way that people want to come to Jesus? And each week I'm gonna be reminding you that and suggesting some very specific ways for us to do that. And I know that together at the end of the time that we've spent in this study on the parables, all of our lives will have seen God do great things. And I love you and I love doing this with you. And I can't wait for us to see how we apply, the Holy Spirit applies these important things that Jesus has chosen to teach then and chooses to teach now because we wanna hear and we wanna do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my friends and I pray that as we close this Sunday together. As I've already mentioned, God, it just seems like the deck was sort of stacked against uh, us today. The weather, the post-Easter sort of lull, the time of year, the travel schedules, the kids and the sports and all the stuff that just competes for our hearts, for our attention, for our time in this, this life. And I just pray that you supernaturally would intervene in our lives. Give us an internal desire to allow you to be in charge, to be Lord of our thoughts, of our attitudes and of our actions. If any of them are displeasing to you, Father, reveal them to us because we want to be part of heaven coming down and our closest relationships. If you have show us that we are not being Christ-like, that we're not giving, that we're not serving, that we're not forgiving, that we're not filled with grace and compassion, convict us to change and give us the strength to live differently. If we're not investing by the way we live, earning the right to say things that line up with your kingdom, with the people who we're in contact with on a regular basis, family, coworkers, friends. Give us that motivation and opportunity to be part of what it is that you're doing as the baton has been passed to us. As a church, we want to represent your kingdom where Jesus Christ is in charge. And that's our commitment to you. Thank you for continuing each week to do great things in the lives of my friends. As you draw them closer to yourself, fill them with power and with joy and with love. And as we leave this place, I pray that we would go and we would live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.